Hey everybody, and welcome to Between Two Moose, a show where we talk about trends and topics in teaching and learning tied to technology. I'm your co-host, Chris Sessoms, um, Director of Academic Affairs at D2L, and I'm joined by my co-host, Kenneth Chapman, who is Vice President of Market Research at D2L. Ken, it's so good to see you. Good to see you too, Chris. And, and you've got like a, like a Clapton vibe going on today, you know, like rock and roll background. So I'm, I'm expecting to see a little bit of edge to you today, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I, should, I should be pulling out a, a guitar at some point during uh, this, this, uh, uh, this our webcast here. But, um, you know, Ken, we last talked um, at when, when the world was just about, uh, uh, the world was changing very rapidly last time we met. Um, and we started talking a little bit about COVID and, and some things to think about as instructors were moving online or, or teaching remotely. And I know you've had an opportunity to speak to a number of customers through our advisory boards and been meeting with a lot of folks. And uh, I'm really curious to hear some of the things that you've been picking up um, from, the, from your research that, that you're hearing uh, for supporting instructors teaching online or, or, or working remotely. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to share some of that, Chris, for, for what it's worth. And, and on top of that, um, uh, you know, I'm, I've been up to my elbows in trying to get my kids' school online and, and standing up in LMS and their curriculum. Um, so shout out to Deercroft Montessori School. You guys have done some amazing work over the last week, and, and thanks for everything. Uh, but there's been a lot of lessons learned firsthand from that, and, and I'm happy to be a little prescriptive about some of the things that I've learned and that I've heard from our, our customers and, and others in the space that are working well you know, for those that are making that transition from crisis learning, really, into thinking about how do I, how do you get something that's more sustainable, um, more equitable, um, and, and hopefully um, more long-lived um, as a, a strategy for, for teaching online, because we're all going to have these same backgrounds for a little while, it looks like. No, that's, that's so true. Um, you know, and, and before I, I, I jump into that level, Ken, I forgot to, uh, and you'll have to forgive me, I just want to say, how are you doing? How's your family holding up in, in light of the situation here? We're doing well. We're doing well. Everybody's healthy. Um, we had to have it a trip to the emergency room last week, which was not fun, but everybody is, is fine and okay from that, which is great. Um, and, and probably like others, um, I just want to see everybody around me be healthy and, and respect social distancing norms and, and let's, you know, let's do what we can to, to help our frontline healthcare workers. Um, they're doing some amazing work. They really are. And I'm glad to hear everything's okay um, with your family as well. Yeah, things are relatively normal here. My, the, my son that lives with us, he's in college and was going face to face and is now doing everything online. So he's, um, he'll be finishing up the semester online and it sounds like the, the summer semester is going to be online and the fall semester is going to be online. So we're, we're kind of getting used to something of a new normal. Things are starting to, to, to I, I want to say, feel a little more routine now. So um, we've gotten over that immediate sort of crisis. Um, all of us have felt at some point something fluttering in our stomach or in our heads and going, oh no, is this it? Um, but, but so far, knock wood, everybody's maintained, uh, been maintaining their health and, um, Good. and I'm, glad, I'm glad that that's the case. I'm glad to hear everything's okay with your family too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I'm, uh, I'm always curious, when, when faculty are starting out, uh, or um, you, you start looking at moving online, there's a lot of things to consider. And I know we talked a little bit about that last time, mm -hmm. but you know, one of the things I think that's most important to think about as we even, as we move in this direction is the, the, the I'll say the novelness, the newness of teaching online and the anxiety that sort of is yeah. accompanied by that. Are you hearing anything from our customers about that anxiety or what they're dealing with? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, we're, we're dealing with, with um, challenges that people are feeling and, and their emotional reactions to it more than we are dealing with a, a technology problem here. Um, and, and it's not just for, for those that are teaching online, although I know all of you that are doing that, just I, I, I'm learning firsthand just how disruptive and anxiety um, ridden that can be. Um, but it's important to remember, too, that your learners are feeling a lot of the same anxiety as well. Um, as much as, as we may think of them as, um, you know, digital natives and, and comfortable with technology, that doesn't mean that they're comfortable being a self-regulated learner. It doesn't mean that they have some of those, 
those skills to manage their own time and to, you know, properly interpret and, and fill in the blanks of, of um, instructions that they don't understand or, you know, what to do next. Um, so, you know, I've, I've been, you know, really thinking a lot about some of the ways that, that instructors are, are helping to plan through some of that anxiety and, and embrace it and, and represent that in, in how they're um, presenting their, their courses. Um, so, go ahead, Chris. Sorry. No, I was going to say when it comes to plan, you know, that's, that's one of my favorite words. My, one of my favorite four letter words um, is plan. Um, and I, and I love planning. Uh, uh, my father was the son of a Navy man and, and we were raised with this idea of uh, proper prior planning prevents poor performance. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I found planning to be the one saving grace. I feel like when I first started teaching online, was uh, because I didn't know what I was stepping into. I, I had no idea how I was gonna really do this and make it engaging or have a sense of community in my class. So planning, I think, really was an important step for me. Are, are there any specifics that you picked up along the way when you were talking to folks about planning? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, th I think a really key thing is, is to think about your constraints and, and the constraints of your learners. Um, you know, uh, what I've heard is there's a lot of educators just trying to feel out the, feel out the medium um, are rotating to giving their kids more homework and, and kids feeling more overwhelmed than they had before when, you know, they're, they're ramping up their understanding, they're managing that anxiety too. Um, and, and similarly, you know, a faculty that have, have do dove into online learning um, haven't thought enough about or, or didn't have the, the foresight to, to think, what's the demands on my time going to be once these children start or, or learners um, start submitting their work? And, and start creating that opportunity for me to, to evaluate their feedback and show that they're looking at it while planning the next week and while making all of the clicks and drags that are necessary um, to make that work. So, you know, I, I really recommend strongly plan your time. You know, think about how much time are you expecting your learners to spend in a week uh, in your course or, or in a day, however it makes sense for you. And look at, you know, what are, what are the schedule of synchronous meetings that you may have with them, Zoom calls or otherwise? Um, what resources are you putting out there for them? You know, links that you're sharing, material for them to read. Um, and what activities are you giving them um, to, to, to hand in and, and to show their work? And how much time is it going to take them to do that? And, and not just the work, but the process of figuring out what they need to do, um, handing it in, um, you know, documenting it in, in a, a, a word processing application. If they are not doing that, it's going to take them extra time. Um, so to think about that and to do that for yourself as well. You know, for every activity that you go and assign out to your, your learners, um, where you're expecting them to, to hand work back or, or to give them some feedback, that's a big chunk of time on your behalf as well. So you need to, you need to sort of account for those things. And if you've got more time in the calendar than you know the, the kids can manage or the learners can manage and more time than you can manage, then you're gonna have to take some stuff away from that. And, and that's where rethinking activities or, or just taking a mindset of less is more is gonna be helpful. That's really well said, Ken. Um, I'm a big fan of that as well. I know I learned firsthand when I was teaching about, uh, I thought I had to keep them time on task, keep them busy, 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 and then what I didn't realize was how much work that was creating for me <laughs> as, right. as an instructor. And that's just as important as creating, you know, time for, for my learners was creating time for me to manage all that. So I, that's really well put. I'm, I'm glad you said that. A another thing that I'm always interested in, and it's, it's been something that's been in, in conversation within, in distance education research for many years, um, is this idea of presence you know, like instructor presence um, in, in a distance class, recognizing we have this transactional distance as it's called, um, separated, being separated by geography, but we have a lot of tools to help bridge that distance, that transactional distance. And one of the things I saw, I think in, in some of your research, you were talking about this idea of, of, of presence in terms of showing yourself. Can you mm -hmm. elaborate on that, a little, on that a little bit for us? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, interfacing with the, the, the website or an online environment, um, it creates a little bit of distance immediately, right? It's not the classroom. You don't feel the energy, the, hear the sounds of people, see their faces. So when somebody comes into an online learning environment and they're greeted by their instructor, a, a, a familiar face, and somebody who's just as vulnerable as them, you know, where you're showing 
this is my living room. You know, here's my kid's laundry pile, you know, right beside me. Um, I'll just get that out of the way there. Um, <laughs> you know, that's, that, that, that disarms things. It, it levels the playing field and, and it creates a bit of that connection. And, you know, that's not something that's just valuable to do once when you're introducing, you know, welcome to the course, now, you know, move in and start dealing with the robot. That can be done throughout, you know, when you're, when you're setting expectations for, for learners on what you want them to do for an activity, record a little video of yourself doing that. It doesn't have to be all typed out in text and, and sanitary or, or, or um, flat like that. You can bring your, yourself into that. You can bring your own energy and, and your own dynamics to it. Um, that's really important for, for online presence. Um, and again, be vulnerable. You know, you're not going to be polished. Again, we're not in a five-star hotel. We're putting cots in a gym right now. Um, and it, you know, that recognition that, you know, this isn't perfect and, and that you're working through some anxiety and some learning on your own front, it will encourage your students to share feedback with you. And when you do create that forum to listen to your students on what's working, you know, where are you getting confused what should I stop doing, start doing, continue doing? Your students will feel free to, to give you more of that feedback and be more authentic with you because you've, you've sort of opened yourself for that. And, and I highly recommend creating that closed loop process where you do talk to your students and ask them, how do you make this environment and, and things um, um, worthwhile for them? One of the things I, I hear uh, really often um, from faculty when they're, they've you know, elicited some of that feedback from their students is really on being clear with instructions and, and taking the time to think about, you know, what, is, what are multiple ways that I can describe what my expectations for students are? Um, can I put dates on things? You know, do I record myself in a video telling them how I want to complete this activity? Do I give them a couple bullet points out there? And do I create those instructions in a consistent way every time I wanna tell the students to do something? You know, so that when, I, when they want to go find information, they know where they can go. When you're starting to put material in a course online, you need to think about the learning management system kind of like the campus for the student. They're going to go to the campus to go and get everything, and they're going to come into your course um, like your classroom. And you don't move your classroom around in different buildings, and you don't post the things that were on the walls or whatever in, in completely different areas every week. And you shouldn't be doing that online either. You know, if you always describe this week's activities are happening here and this is where you can get that information in a very consistent way, it eliminates some of the questions that you're going to get from your, your students on just what do I need to do or, or how do I need to do this? Um, and it also starts to take some of that anxiety down from, from the learners themselves because they have that clarity of, of expectation and they know where to go to get it when the time comes where there's a new activity. Well, you said that really well, Ken. And for those of it, for those of you just joining us, welcome to Between Two Moose. Uh, this is a show where where Ken Chapman and I uh, get to talk about trends and topics related to teaching and learning and technology. And today we're looking at as as you move online in this uh, new world of online learning and remote learning, um, things that you ought to be thinking about, um, things to help you be a better and more present. Uh, instructor, I think, are things that are really important to us and things that we've been looking at very closely. I've been doing teaching and learning online for about 20 years now, and um, it's one of those things where um, I'm finding my phone is ringing off the hook. <laughs> now, pretty much um, helping people work around uh, planning and, and what to prepare for uh, mm -hmm. around teaching and learning online. Ken, your comments about consistency are so well, well framed. Um, that is super important um, in thinking about the organization of your content in your, in your class. And, and another key thing that I just want to echo that you said earlier that I think is super important is this idea of empathy. And I, and I really want to emphasize and underscore how you've been pointing out the importance of communicating with students and, and soliciting feedback, eliciting feedback from them. Um, and that level of empathy, I think, is, is what is, is so important right now, especially in this uncertainty in establishing a really strong learning community. And, and for me, that's been my goal all along when I, when I teach, whether it's face-to-face -face or online, is establishing that sort of ground rules for a community that we're all in this together, we all share together, 
And my role really as an educator is just the, to be the, the lead model student. Like I, I model the kinds of behaviors that I want my students to, to uh, practice as well. So that's always been yep. real important. And you've been emphasizing that in, in, in your research, which I think is fantastic because they are overwhelmed uh, with so much stuff right now. Um, and there's a lot of little things I know that you can do within a learning management system, um, any type, where um, you can really help students stay focused. And I know one of the things that, that I've, I've heard you talk about uh, um, before, Ken, is this idea of, you mentioned putting dates on things um, and checklists. I know checklists for me were super important in helping students know where they had to be and what they needed to do. Even right. though I had it in the syllabus and I had it in the course, I found if I created just one more little element of a checklist, then students would go, okay, I know for sure. When it, whatever, whatever Sessoms puts on that checklist, he's going he's gonna to demand. So I found that that was another really good um, strategy I used to help keep my students you know, so they knew what, what to expect. Because right now, Days are blending and blurring into each other. We don't know <laughs> are they what, ever? What day, what time it is. So uh, I really appreciate the, the, the advice you've been sharing here. Yeah, uh, I mean, we, yeah. we've been trying to apply that. Um, I've been trying to work with even the, the teachers at Deercroft that I've been working with for my kids' school. And, and, you know, we've been finding that it's, you know, again, these practices of universal design for learning are, are coming into play where we found it really effective. And these are younger learners, of course. Um, but we found it really effective to create a checklist for the week um, with some daily activities that, you know, the, the learners can, can mark off and, and sort of have that, again, a little bit of that reward. Um, there, there's, a, there's a payoff mentally and, and um, anxiety-wise for knowing that you're moving forward and you're completing things. Um, so that's helpful to have. But we've also found things, again, showing information in multiple formats um, is really important. So you know, while we started building out checklists, we started creating dates on, on when the checklist items should be completed, but also adding those into the, the calendar for the class. Um, some, some learners and, and parents uh, may be more adept at looking at things from the checklist format. Others that we're finding are more adept at doing it um, from within the calendar. Fortunately, how we're setting it up, it's kind of done once from the teacher perspective, but people can consume it the way that they want to. Similarly, you know, how the, the, um, the activities to be completed are being introduced. We're recording really quick little webcam videos for each of the checklist items, again, for that presence of the teacher um, and to explain the activity. But then in the checklist item itself, we're linking to the activity with its own instructions in it. So just trying to create that, those, all of those opportunities are along the way to align people on the same information, the same expectations, and to ease their fears about all of the things that are outside of this learning activity that we're actually trying to do through all of this. Ken, let me ask you something about, um, about video. So I know one of the first things that we saw when we were looking across the landscape for over the last few weeks was a rush to get online and a, more specifically a rush to get on video. Um, and, and I know video can, can serve a lot of different purposes. It's gonna be a very powerful tool for teaching and learning, um, specifically at a distance. But uh, talk to me about alternatives. Are, are, in your research, are you seeing um, faculty experimenting with alternatives to video at all? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, uh, I think some, some whole organizations and some faculty kind of have figured this out and, and have been doing this already. And I think others that are in, in the Zoom world um, right now, or, or Zoom-ish things, um, probably are, are starting to get <laughs> fatigued with this, um, or looking for some alternatives, again, that are, are maybe a little bit more equitable, um, a little bit more scalable. Um, I mean, we know, uh, we know that learners prefer to be able to, to work on their own time when they're working online, and to be able to consume resources um, on their own schedule, and to come back to them later as a reference. Um, and that's something to be really aware of when you're looking at, um, you know, um, meetings like this, um, you know, captioning of them to make them um, searchable is, is super important, um, as is being able to have it as a, a resource after the fact. Um, but, but, you know, this, this crisis can, can sort of help us to, to question some of the things uh, that we've been doing in the past as well. Maybe a lecture in a long form lecture isn't the best way to, to represent a, a concept um, or a lesson online. And if it is, it's, it's best done in shorter format. 
Um, you know, keeping videos to, and videos are great. Don't get me wrong on that. The presence in a video and, and the connection that it makes is, is invaluable. And it's by far the most common type of content we see, but 10 to 15 minutes is, is kind of a sweet spot. Um, and not longer than that, you know, you start to lose your audience, you get fatigued. We know people take less natural breaks when they're working online. So 10 or 15 minutes and add an activity you know, add a thought experiment, add something they do to, to post to discussions, um, have them, you know, record themselves um, reacting to the idea that you explained. Um, it can be a great way to work through some of the limitations that might happen in an online meeting. Um, you know, your wallflowers. If you have a, a, a room of more than 15 people even, it's really hard to expect every single individual in the room to, to speak up and share their ideas. But if you have a little 10 or 15 minute, five minute video explaining a lesson, you know, a challenge question or, or something to, to um, reflect on. And you ask all of your students, post 30 seconds of yourself in the discussion area reacting to this. Again, use video to do that. It's really simple. Uh, the LMS will let you do it on the webcam. You don't have wallflowers that way. Everybody gets to see each other and, and you may see perspectives and, and connections that wouldn't exist otherwise. And again, things that people can go back and look at as a reference and ideas that they can add to and, and layer on and an opportunity for connection that can be more long lived than, than just happened in that meeting itself. The other thing to, to really think about when we're looking at, at video and, and online rooms is accessibility. Again, I always come back to accessibility, you know me, but looking at bandwidth, um, a lot of you guys are gonna have learners in rural areas that don't have high bandwidth connections they're going to be turning their cameras off in Zoom. You know, they're just going to be trying to, to hear through the garble sometimes. Mm -hmm. So when you're recording your lessons and, and posting them, they can be downloaded for offline viewing. Um, you know, people can, can take time to, to look at things and, and to post them. And it's a little bit more equitable access to, to being part of that conversation. That's a good point. You know, I, I'm, I've, I've talked to several of my colleagues who are... Um, very, uh, very good at lecturing. Um, and they have a lot of lot to say. And they, they say it in a way that uh, I, I was concerned, how are they going to break it down into 10, 15 minute chunks? It's one of the most, you know, sort of challenging things I see for some professors is, is being able to make that leap. Um, and so we've been having these uh, I'll call them arguments, very, very uh, professional collegial arguments. around. <laughs> Can you, um, it, it, is, is it more effective at 15 minutes or can I do an hour lecture? And, and I found so much ha had to do with the context of what they were talking about, the, the, the field that they were covering, um, and how the pre and post activities, to your point, that they, that they started with so that it kept learners engaged at a level. If I'm going to talk for 40 minutes, I need to give you something that you should be listening for or things that I want yes. you to be focusing on um, if I'm going to talk for 40 minutes. So I, I recognize it's hard for some folks to make that switch. But um, I know that the alternatives uh, to if, if you really, really must um, lecture for an hour, um, there are some things you can do pre and post, as you mentioned, Ken, and I'm glad you brought that up, uh, uh, to, to ask students to remember, keep an eye on or listen up for this when I mention this, this is a really important point, or, or give them cues as to what you think should, is most important for them to know within that time period. Yeah, and, and Chris, at, at the risk of being overly bold, and you can smack me down, you know, as being the, the, the real educator here, but, you know, it's, it, it, it creates a challenge as well, you know, here we're talking about students that are learning online, and maybe you do away with the lecture. You know, lectures are a huge amount of work. And this, this is, I, I've talked to some folks about this. I don't know how scalable this is. You talk to me. But lectures are a huge amount of work for, for educators. There's a ton of work that goes into that. But, you know, if, if, again, right tool for the right job. But if your students have the ability to, to find resources, to analyze them, to evaluate them, and to present them in a coherent manner, maybe they can be doing some of that organization and that curation of a lecture themselves. And, and maybe that's part of the activity. Um, having, the, having them be more of creators rather than passive. Um, again, meeting students where they are, they, a lot of them expect to be creators online. Um, and again, me, where, you, where you are, if you don't have the time to, to build those lectures, maybe there's a different way to look at those things.
I don't know, Chris, is that something that makes you angry to hear or is it realistic under the right circumstances? No, it's, it's, uh, you, you made a fair point about sort of, uh, uh, you know, not generalizing and, and saying, you know, under the right circumstances. I think that's the key. I think it's, it's, it's the, um, you know, we forget that what we have here when we talk about technology and teaching and learning is this fabulous toolbox, right? And so yeah. um, while a hammer can be used for all kinds of different you know, functionality, um, it's really best serves you to do specific kinds of tasks, right? So uh, I would argue the same with the technology um, for learning, right? That um, certain tools lend themselves better to, to certain aspects as well. So um, Ken, I know we're running, we're running close to time here. Uh, there was one other, important concept that I thought was important that we, we, we touched on that I thought would be fun to finish up on is talking about feedback yep. and, and the importance of feedback um, and timeliness of feedback, especially now. Um, I have, a, as I mentioned, my youngest son who's in college right now, um, it's just now getting back papers that he uh, uh, and homework assignments that he turned in, um, in in February and March, and he's just <laughs> now getting them back. So the feedback there is, is a little bit disappointing, and it is for him as well. Um, but uh, talk to me about what you're hearing from, from customers about feedback and how, yeah. how are they addressing that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, at, at D2L, we we spent a, a better chunk of a year building a tool just to try to reduce the time to feedback um, for for students because we recognize just how important that is for for student engagement. So again, I would I would recommend you know as you're making that plan and making Chris happy by having a plan, think about you know what do you have the time built in there to be responsive to students that are submitting and to turn that time to feedback around relatively quickly. And it doesn't have to be, um, you know, a, a, a massive um, essay written back to them. You know, a quick recording of, of yourself, again, using, using video to create some of that presence, um, to give some meaningful feedback, to recognize progress, um, can be really valuable. Um, similarly, um, setting expectation. So again, in the same way that we want to set expectation for how um, uh, instructions for doing activities and you know, how students know what they need to do, you want to set expectation for how you're going to evaluate them and how they're going to be assessed and, and even exemplars of work. And again, rubrics are a really effective way to do that. You know, when you're giving instruction to the, the students, they can see up front, here is the, the objective vehicle that's going to be used and the different criteria. And when they get that feedback back, it's consistent with that. It's consistent with their expectations. It's done in that format that they're expecting it. Um, and it's consumable. Um, so if you're doing, you know, regularly weekly activities that are using a similar rubric on, you know, reading response journals or, or something, for example, um, that, that's really helpful for students, again, to have that muscle memory of what, what is my expectation and how can I hone and grow along those different skills and, and criteria that are being laid out. Um, I think that's really important. The, the last thing is, Encourage your, encourage your students to give you authentic evidence. You know, um, take advantage of the fact that they've got a phone in their hand, likely, um, and ask them to show themselves doing something. Um, it creates a little bit of personality. It helps people see their classmates and know that there are other people going through this as well. And, you know, some of us have a workstation that's the corner of a room and, and we're all getting by. Um, it can be helpful for creating that community mentality um, as well as, Again, seeing what other people are doing and, and helping to grow by getting new perspectives. Those are all great points, Ken. You know, and what you were triggering in my mind is I was thinking about that feedback and, and ways to approach it. I, I, you triggered in my mind thinking about play and the importance of play in all of this as well. I, I think sometimes we're, we're, so, we're so focused on, you know, the academic nature of, of teaching and learning in both K-12 and higher ed, and we forget about the play aspect of it. Yeah. Um, and, and to give ourselves some room to um, experiment a little bit with this. Like you said, try, try using the video or asking students to give you video feedback. Well, it, it can't hurt. It's, it's what this media was built to do. <laughs> and, and, it, and it's just, it's an opportunity to try it. And if it doesn't work, you can try it again, or you can move on and try something else. But it's, um, I, I'm, I'm really excited. The one, the only thing that excites me about any of this crisis is it's, it's, it's pushing us to try things differently. It's pushing yeah. educators to, to re 
imagine how they do their job. Um, and with the technology, you have a lot of different choices that you can make and things to play with that um, I think it's a great opportunity to play. This is a real opportunity for a renaissance, I think, in, in teaching and learning. So that's the that's the silver lining for me, <laughs> Chris. I think that's I think that's the perfect final thought. Um, personally, I think I think that challenge to to try new things and and to play, have fun with it, let people be creative. You know, your, our neurons are firing when we get a chance to to create something and share that with others. Great point, Ken. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to Between Two Moose with Ken Chapman and myself, Chris Sessoms. Um, there are lots and lots of great resources for educators that we have available for you on our Brightspace community page. Um, up at the top of the page, you'll see a big link that has COVID on it. If you click on that link, that'll take you to all of our resources. Um, we're, we're wanting to make sure that we can support as many educators as we can. Um, and we're so thankful for everybody that's continuing to, to work on the front lines and, and, and support our health and happiness and well-being throughout this entire process. So Ken, you're such a bright and shining face. I'm so happy we have this opportunity to have this conversation and we get to record it for posterity's sake. And um, we, I also want to encourage folks, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them uh, with us and Ken and I will follow up with you as soon as we can. So thank you again for tuning in. Thank you. Stay healthy, everybody. <laughs>